Good afternoon. I'm Brian Lawrence, the Deputy Executive Director of the Seattle Public Library Foundation. And I want to welcome all of you to this exciting event today to talk about books with our returning guest, Liz Camfjord of Penguin Random House. I'd like to welcome all of our library supporters, our donors, uh, our advocates, uh, and our volunteers. Uh, thank you all so much for supporting the, both the Seattle Public Library Foundation and the library itself. So I know that uh, books have carried many of us through this year, whether you're uh, reading a hardback with a cup of tea or listening to an audiobook while um, washing dishes. Uh, this, the wonderful thing about literature is that it's always evolving and generating exciting new material for us to explore. And while the rest of our lives may seem on hold or somewhat out of balance, uh, it's nice to know that we can always count on books as a, as a welcome relief. So it's exciting to see the new treasures that are in store for us over the coming months and our favorite books. Um, and, but before I turn it over to our guest, uh, let me remind you of a few tools on Zoom to help with our conversation. First, uh, I want to direct you to the chat window. If you have any technical issues, um, you can use the chat button to reach out to us. We have some of our foundation teammates monitoring the space to help you if you have any um, tech trouble. And next, if you have uh, any questions for Liz, you can use the um, Q&A button, uh, and we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can in the final portion of our presentation today. So we love your questions. So, and if you're looking for a book recommendation that doesn't get covered today, go ahead and ask that question in the Q&A. So without further ado, let's just jump right in. Um, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Liz Camfjord. Liz has worked at Penguin Random House for 25 years, and she is a sales manager who supports libraries across 19 states west of the Mississippi River. And Penguin Random House is the largest book publisher in the world with uh, about $3.3 billion in annual sales. And I suspect that's going to be even bigger when they merge with uh, Simon & Schuster, creating a real publishing powerhouse. So I highly encourage you to grab a notepad um, because you might want to write down the titles that interest you. And we'll also be posting this event on the foundation's YouTube page uh, where you can watch it again or you can share it with your fellow book lovers or your book groups. Uh, and again, that's the foundation's YouTube page and, and not the libraries. And Liz has a lot of slides. So we're gonna go, uh, I'm gonna softly interject myself at about 40 minutes so we can um, take a few of your questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Liz and we're gonna fire up um, the slideshow and welcome Liz and thanks so much for, for being with us today. Thank you, Brian. I'm so excited to talk to avid readers. So I know you're going to share your screen. And I also loved seeing the intro slides and all the good works that Seattle Public Library Foundation is doing to help with literacy and support families. That's just so wonderful. Okay, so there's some beautiful artwork from our Christmas Penguin Classic series. And um, the next, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to all of the virtual events and tools that we have at Penguin Random House. So every day you could tap into author events. Um, if you go to penguinrandomhouse.com, authors events, you'll see a schedule, a daily schedule. And um, I feel certain that there are authors on virtual tour that you will wanna hear from. I'm attending uh, three to five a week. Uh, you can also follow us on YouTube. Penguin Li Random House Library Reps is our Facebook page um, that we update frequently, really lively, again, with uh, events that we're hosting. And um, there's just no, you could spend your whole day <laughs> with Penguin Random House if you wanted to. And here I've just rounded up some of the best uh, books of the year lists. And many of these I'm sure you've read are familiar to you. Very special nonfiction and, and novels. And so just, love to see that slide. And next, so Library Reads is a, um, 
an organization of librarians where librarians are able to vote each month on their picks of from all publishers, uh, their top 10 books of that month. So here are um, the December Penguin Random House uh, Library Reads books. And I just wanted to call out Perestroika in Paris. Um, Perestroika in Paris is Jane Smiley's return to adult fiction. She's been writing some middle grade uh, horse stories, but this is actually a book for all ages. And Perestroika is a racehorse uh, nicknamed Paris whose stall is open one day. And so Paris decides to wander out a very curious filly and meets up with a dog, some ducks, um, uh, a, a raven, and ventures all around Paris. Uh, and it's just a beautiful, magical story. Jane Smiley, as you know, won, probably know, won the Pulitzer Prize for A Thousand Acres. And this is just a marvelous, marvelous, heartwarming and lighthearted tale. And then the other book on this slide that I wanted to call out just go back real quick, is The Children's Blizzard. So Melanie Benjamin is really um, a librarian and, and patron favorite with her historical, no historical novels that take on uh, celebrity figures often, like Truman Capote and Howard Hughes. And now she's sort of departed and The Children's Blizzard is getting rave reviews. It takes on um, a legendary blizzard from 1888 in the Dakota territories, um, little written about and very much affected immigrant families of that um, area and, and the children. And it follows the story of two teachers who are sisters. And so she did um, amazing research talking to uh, survivors, family members, and going into the archives. So that's a really special book. And then also The Push, which is a debut. And this is for fans of The Perfect Nanny. It, it's a controversial book novel. It explores motherhood. Um, if you know that the film and the novel, we need to talk about Kevin. That's the sort of story we have here about a mother who longs to be a mother, but um, when she has her daughter, she feels not the bond that she hoped for. And it's it, it's a strange um, sort of bad seed tale. Her husband doesn't believe what she's getting from, from her daughter. And it's just a really um, intense thriller about motherhood. And the author actually used to work for Penguin Random House and she lives in Canada. And next, Miss Benson's Beetle. So Miss Benson's Beetle is the latest in the First Look Book Club. Oh, actually, I think it was last week. So the First Look Book Club is um, a book club, an online book club uh, hosted by Suzanne Beecher, who's a book blogger, and she's got an infectious personality. She loves uh, she loves to talk about books, and this is a way, if you sign up for this for free, you get a chapter a day for five days in your email. And Miss Benson's Beetle, I wanted to highlight because this is a really beautiful debut about an unlikely friendship between two women who are, who are on the hunt for the golden beetle, the rare golden beetle. And they travel the world to, to find this new Caledonia golden beetle. So it's kind of an enchanted April and just a beautiful friendship story. And next. So book clubs, you know, there are so many celebrity book clubs, but um, several that we, we really love and like to highlight are um, first Reese's Book Club. And Reese's Book Club this month has chosen the Chicken Sisters, which is um, a fun, feel good uh, novel about three generations and two chicken shacks. So this is informed by the author's experience of going to these fried chicken restaurants as a child when she would visit her grandparents in Kansas. And it's really her love letter to Kansas and it's quirky, lovable residents. If you like J. Ryan, J. Ryan Stradall's novel, The Logger Queen of Minnesota, that's the sort of um, warmth and personality and quirkiness of this novel. And then Jenna Bush's book club um, for the Today Show is uh, The Bluest Eye this month. And Jenna was just very affected by this um, novel, which was Nobel laureate Toni Morrison's first novel, a, a poignant reflection of a young girl's life and as she struggles with beauty in Lorraine, Ohio. 
And then at the bottom there is Good Morning America's next book club pick. So this is this time next year, and it centers on a couple who share a New Year's Eve or a New Year's birthday. It's chock full of scenes from New Year's Eve's past and present. It's a, a rom-com and um, it's set in England. It's perfect for readers and, and fans of Josie Silver's One Day in December. And next, we have, um, I wanted to draw your attention to this wonderful new book club um, brochure that we have digitally. Um, it's diverse voices, I know, Many of these novels pictured here are familiar to you. I know that Seattle Reads uh, read There, There by Tommy Orange. So just something if you go to our library marketing website, uh, you can download if you need some good ideas uh, for your book club. And next. So these are books on the small screen. The Queen's Gambit, Gambit of course, is a phenomena. Uh, we have the novel, we have the novel um, that uh, The Midnight Sky, which um, is about to premiere on Netflix, is based on. And then uh, Henry James' Turn of the Screw has been adapted to The Haunting of Bly Manor. And Shirley, which is about Shirley Jackson, is still on Hulu. And I wanted to highlight that because it's a really um, kind of manipulative, interesting uh, adaptation that I enjoyed very much. And next, so we just had um, it announced, the National Book Awards were announced and we have two winners on that list. And the first is Tokyo Ueno Station and this one for Fiction in Translation. Um, it's a surreal, devastating story of a homeless ghost who haunts one of Tokyo's busiest train stations. And it's uh, also a very fresh uh, take um, on politics and class, uh, family and trauma. And um, the narrator is the ghost um, who was born in Fukushima in 1933. Uh, his life has been very much tied to the Japanese imperial family, but his story is one of bad luck. Um, he was a laborer who was preparing for the 1964 um, Tokyo Olympics, um, but he ended his days in the vast homeless village right there at the train sta uh, stations park. Um, and he's traumatized by, as a ghost, by the destruction of the 2011 tsunami, shattered by the announcement of the Tokyo, uh, the 2020 Olympics. And we see um, this busy train station in all these people's lives through his eyes and learn more about his story. Um, so the author is a star in Japan, but this is her first uh, novel in, in English. And she actually lives in Fukushima. And then Interior Chinatown, who you, you may know this novel, it just uh, is about to come out in paperback or just came out in paperback. Um, it's a, set in Los Angeles. Uh, the author lives in LA. It's um, about Willie, Willis Wu, who is a TV actor. He plays a generic Asian character on um, a TV, a, like a cop TV show. And yet he dreams to be um, a Kung Fu master, but his mother, uh, is, tells him really dream bigger than that. So this is a send up of Hollywood. It's um, a really touching story. It's mostly hilarious. It's what I'm reading right now from my book club. And the author was um, really knows a lot about TV and Hollywood. He um, was a writer on the show Westworld. Um, and he calls Chinatown a mental ghetto, a manifestation of the very limited real estate Asian Americans are permitted in American culture. And it got um, lots of starred reviews as a multi-generational epic that's rollicking entertainment and scathing commentary. And next, so I love Elizabeth Berg. You may know her um, previous novels. Um, she has won lots of awards, Durable Goods, Joy School um, were best books of the year. She's been writing for, for decades, but this is um, a different kind of book for her. It's a memoir about her parents. It's a love letter to her parents as they age, as her father um, is dealing with Alzheimer's. Uh, they had um, a beautiful marriage. It, it's a compassionate story, um, and she 
uh, you know, really talks about the transitions as they're forced to leave their, their home that they've lived in for all of their marriage and go into um, assisted care. And so it's about, you know, acceptance and, and love, and it takes place in St. Paul, Minnesota, where she lives. And then my meteorite is one of my favorites. Harry Dodge is an artist here. He's, been, he's exhibited um, all over the world in museums all over the world. He's also married to the poet Maggie Nelson. I'm a fan of hers. And she wrote about him in her book, The Argonauts. And so now this is his turn to talk about his life, his artist's life, also about gender fluid um, authors and artists. It's told in sort of a Alice B. Toklas way, but it also is about Alzheimer's and his father's descent into dementia at the same time that he's rekindling a relationship with his birth mother. So it's a portrait of the artist. Um, it's very, very dear book. And the title refers to an actual meteorite that Harry orders on eBay. And that becomes his touchstone for questions about love and consciousness. And it's a very philosophical but accessible book. And next, so these are two um, memoirs that will be familiar to you probably, um, as they both are already out. Um, Megan Rapinoe, you know, as the um, Olympic gold medalist and two-time Women's World Cup champion. But this is her memoir really about her life as an activist and um, you know, also dealing with things like getting into it with President Trump on Twitter and, and there's going to be a young reader's edition uh, to come with this too, which should be interesting. And then The Freezer Door um, by Matilda Bernstein Sycamore is um, a very powerful book. She, um, they were the winner of the Lambda and Stonewall Awards. And The Freezer Door records the ebb and flow of desire in daily life, crossing through loneliness in search of communal pleasure in Seattle. And next, I wanted to highlight some audiobook favorites. So um, what I'm listening to now is Green Lights and where, you know, whether you're a fan of Matthew McConaughey or not, um, this is really entertaining. I had no clue what an amazing storyteller he is and not just, you know, lightweight stories. This is really about, you know, yes, becoming an actor, but also just the struggles of his, um, his childhood and um, his family life and, and certainly becoming a parent and all that. Of course, it's really funny. He just has this pacing and this phrasing that's just really fun to listen to, but it's also an affirmational um, story or an aspirational story where green lights um, refers, is the metaphor for you know, success and happiness in life. And then here's some other favorites, of course, becoming just, uh, won the Gram Grammy Award um, for Best Spoken Word. And next, some gift books. So uh, the first on the left there is a gorgeous, evocative, mixed media book um, that asks the question, what does it mean to be Black and alive right now? Um, it presents a succession of startling, beautiful pieces, um, and, and an entrancing rhythm. And readers will go from conversations with activists and academics to memes and Instagram posts, from powerful essays to dazzling paintings and exciting and in, insightful infographics. Um, the authors are writers, curators, and activists from New York City. So it's, yes, a coffee table book, but also um, a much deeper um, book uh, full of a lot of writing as well. And then we've got um, my gift book of the season is Odalenge Flavor. These are plant-based recipes. Um, the, the author was a New York Times bestseller with the book Plenty. And so this has a hundred innovative, super delicious plant-based recipes and both chefs um, that Put this book together are London based. Then Wintering is a rep favorite. This is an elegant personal narrative. It's shot through with lessons from literature, mythology, and the natural world. Um, the author is British. Um, she finds her sources for um, restoration um, in C.S. Lewis and Sylvia Plath 
swimming in icy waters, sailing the Arctic seas. She turns to honeybees. She turns to cooking. This is about really using winter as um, a time of reflection and rest and retreat as in difficult times, as it says in the subtitle. And then the Glorious American Essay is a, a compilation, a hardcover compilation of 100 essays and the um, it's 800 pages. And we range um, with really important American essays from uh, Margaret Fuller to Ralph Ellison to Joan Didion, who I'll also be talking about a little bit later. Um, so his, Philip Lopate, who is, um, you know, a revered poet and essayist. Um, he put together a seminal work that lots of college students use uh, called The Art of the Personal Essay. And he defines American very broadly. So this has a lot of immigrant um, uh, essays in it too, and just would make a, a really great book. And then what, what do I need to say about Julia Child? This is a compilation of her pithy remarks, her wisdom. She's the most beloved, uh, food chef, uh, TV personality um, that ever lived. And I live right near her hometown of Pasadena. So this should be um, a great book for any foodie on your list. And there's another, like an HBO Max series in, um, in the works right now about her life. And then Celia Paul, Self-Portrait. I wanted to include this because we have distribution clients and one of them is, I love, which is the New York Review of Books. Um, they do long lost novels, but they also have some art books. This is um, an art memoir uh, by Celia Paul, who's um, one of the most important contemporary painters in, in Britain, um, but was also uh, the, the muse and um, had a long relationship with Lucian Freud and also has a child, had a child with Lucian Freud. So this is about motherhood, the conflict of being, um, an artist and a mother and the commitment, you know, split commitments, and also very much about um, Lucian Freud. And then next, Cherry Hill. So I, I love this book. I um, am connected to the author through another friend. So I was able to read it while she was shopping it around. Um, it's been published by another client of ours, Monticelli Press, which is a beautiful art Book publisher. This is a hybrid. It's a memoir, um, a graphic memoir. So there are these um, really saturated photographs because uh, Jonah Frank is, is a photographer and a documentarian. She has work in the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, this is her story of her childhood growing up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey with a difficult mother. She grew up with a crucifix on every bedroom wall. Um, and so it's about the tug and, and pull of the mother-daughter relationship. Um, the hook here is that the, the woman enacting, um, portraying her mother in the book is Laura Dern. Uh, the author is friends with Laura Dern, the actress. And, um, but it's the, really the writing, the yearnings and the recognizable, we're roughly the same age. And it's so, so relatable as she yearns for a friendship with Emily Dickinson and a relation, you know, she would pines for Bruce Springsteen. Um, her writing is spectacular and the photos are so quirky and, and interesting. Next. Um, so I love poetry and these are two um, beautiful new newer books. Um, African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song. It has been curated and edited by the poet Kevin Young. And Kevin Young is the um, director of the Schoenberg Center uh, for Research in Black Culture at New York Public Library and also the newly appointed poetry editor of The New Yorker. So this is um, the first gathering, the first anthology of its kind um, it's a literary landmark, um, gathering 250 poets to represent the 250 years of, of struggle. Um, and it just, you know, there are so many recognizable public, uh, poets in here. Also, I love Library of America hardcovers. They 
just gather such special um, anthologies. And In the Lateness of the World is Carolyn Forche's uh, first book of poems in 17 years. She is a giant in contemporary poetry. She's been writing it for 40 years, um, but she's had she's experiencing a renaissance because she wrote a memoir called What You Have Heard Is True about her awakening as a political activist. Um, it's an homage to her mentor uh, that um, took her to El Salvador, El Salvador when she was in her 20s. And, but this is her first collection of poetry. That was a memoir. I highly recommend the memoir and I highly recommend In the Lateness of the World. She's known as a poet of witness and she, um, you know, takes on crossings, metaphorical, about aging. And, uh, you know, she's also doing a lot of virtual events. I saw one at the Alaska, um, the Homer Public Library in Alaska, and it was one of my favorite uh, poetry events I've attended. So next we have uh, my rep pick of, of uh, the season is The Mermaid from Jeju. So this is a pearl of a book. It's a debut novel and its uh, main character is um, Junja. She's 18 years old and she's from a family of Hanyo. Hanyo, I have only recently learned actually from a children's picture book that we published earlier this year, uh, refers to um, female deep sea divers, Korean deep sea divers. So this is set on um, this island, Jeju, and our main character is, is really wanting to make the trek from the, the beach to the mountains uh, to trade abalone with another family. They trade annually abalone for pork. And she is allowed to make this trek, she falls in love, and um, it's, it's her story. It's very much also the story, it's historical fiction about the aftermath of World War II um, on South Korea on this island. Um, it's multi-generational. The relationship with her mother and her grandmother are really you know, seminal here. I don't wanna give any spoilers. It's, it reads to me a little bit like Island of the Blue Dolphins and the reviews are fantastic. It's just starting to really pop up on best of the year lists right now. And next, we're gonna go into um, 2021. So for our lead fiction in January, we have a book, um, that you may have already heard about. The buzz is so intense on this. It's an Indie Next list, which is a list put together by independent bookstores. Um, it's their number one pick, and it's one of Oprah's um, L uh, 32 LGBTQ books that will change the literary landscape in 2021, she says. It's an epic story about forbidden love between two enslaved young men um, on a, a plantation in Mississippi in the Deep South. The author summons the voices of slaver and enslaved alike as he describes the um, brutality um, and, and the colonization of Africa. Um, of all the novels I'm presenting, this is truly the most buzzed about debut, reminiscent of James Baldwin and Toni Morrison. Um, in fact, the author is the creator of a social justice community that you could check out on his website, Son of Baldwin. Um, he was profiled uh, as one of the black male writers of our time in, um, in Time Magazine. And this um, is really about uh, love and, um, and loss and that period of, of history. Um, it also, I, I checked in with the author's um, event this week that he had with, I think it was Prairie Lights Bookstore. And um, no, it was some other interview I was listening to because the book's not out yet. So nobody's doing virtual events through stores or, li or libraries at this time. But he talked about being a comic book fan and how he feels that librarians were his great protectors as he was growing up. Um, bookish in Brooklyn, and he, um, he in fact revealed something I didn't know, but maybe some of you do know that Batgirl, the, the actress Barbara Gordon, uh, the Barbara Gordon who played Batgirl, uh, was a librarian. So um, this to him was evidence of librarians' true superhero status. 
And next we have um, a book for book lovers and word lovers. If you love wordplay like I do, this hilarious and daring debut, which chronicles the misadventures of a lovesick Victorian lexicographer and the young woman put on his trail a century later to uncover his misdeeds. If, you, if that sounds enticing um, and you love learning about little known words, this is going to be a sheer delight. Um, it's also a UK author. Um, yes, it's, I see there that it's absurdist because it is sort of absurdist, um, but it's really about the joy of language and this relationship. Next, if I disappear. So um, this is for lovers of true crime and podcasts. Um, in summary, uh, when her favorite true crime podcast host goes missing, an adrift young woman sets out to investigate and plunges headfirst into the wild back country of Northern California and her own dangerous obsession. Um, the author's a screenwriter, a, a, a journalist, and she um, is developing this for, um, for television right now. Next. So literary luminaries. Here are three of my favorite authors. I, I imagine that many of you feel the same. So The Sun Collective. Um, Charles Baxter hasn't written a novel in a while. I discovered him with his short stories. Uh, he's a master of the short story. He's also written Feast of Love and just um, is returning here with a timely vision of modern America, of consumerism, fanaticism, and the fear that haunt it. It captures the mystery and violence that punctuate our daily lives. Um, it takes on four characters that whose lives intertwine in the city of Minneapolis. As a mother and father search for their son, who was once a promising actor, uh, he's gone missing. Um, they find some clues, and anyway, it takes them to um, a community organization that seems to be very philanthropic in nature, the Sun Collective. Uh, but this also um, leads to all sorts of questions about, um, you know, sort of a cultish following and about faith, and there's an enigmatic leader. Uh, the Wall Street Journal says that of this novel that Baxter continues to chip away at the myth of Midwest's innocence. Um, I tuned into him yesterday as he was speaking. Um, that was the Prairie Lights bookstore event I was, I was just at uh, virtually. And his students just love him. He's great to hear uh, talk about this story. And he, he talks about, it's very dialogue heavy. There are sort of these monologues and he was talking about how um, as, as he has aged, he tries not to be boring and, um, and things tend to more tend more toward monologue, but what he read from this book, if you were to hear it, you just would not, you would have to read the book. It's so fascinating. And then My Year Abroad is um, Cheng Ray Lee, who I've been selling his books and memoirs since he came on the scene with Native Speaker um, for, for many years. Um, this, he's South Korean born, and this is um, his sixth novel, and it's about a kind of a wayward, drifting uh, college student who hooks up with a, a globe-trotting business entrepreneur and has this really rowdy trip across age, Asia with no return ticket, um, and his ordinary life becomes extraordinary. Um, after that year abroad with the businessman, he returns um, home, and in the airport, he has an unlikely, um, he meets up a, an older woman who he starts a relationship with. And so this movie, uh, movie, this book is a juxtaposition between that lifestyle he was living and this sort of domestic scene. So it's very much a character driven, this, this, our protagonist and, and seeing how he's grappling with, um, with his life and growing up. And then Clara and the Sun. So this is Ishiguro's first novel since he won the Nobel Prize. Um, it tells the story of Clara, an artificial friend with outstanding observational qualities, um, who from her place in a store watches uh, those who come in and browse um, and, and those who pass on the street outside. So it's sort of futuristic and it offers um, a look at our, our changing world through the eyes of an unforgettable narrator. 
um, and it explores the fundamental question of what does it mean to love. So when I'm thinking of this in Tokyo Ueno Station with the ghost narrator, um, you know, as I talk about these books, I see these themes that are very enticing. Next. No one is talking about this. Uh, so Patricia Lockwood began with uh, her poetry volume, Motherland, Fatherland, Homeland Sexuals. She was featured, a big feature in the New York Times Magazine. Uh, maybe you've read her. Then she went on to write a memoir about her father, Priest Daddy. And now she's going into um, this novel. So she's a totally versatile writer. And this was just excerpted in The New Yorker. And perhaps you read it. It's a satire. Um, I feel that there's nothing she can't do. She's known as the poet laureate of Twitter. Um, this opens as a woman who's a social media star uh, who posts uh, Travel. She travels the world to meet her adoring fans. She's very much caught up in this rabbit hole, this wormhole of, of social media, until she gets two texts from her mom that bring her out of it. Um, and the texts, one is, something has gone wrong, and the other is, how soon can you get here? So real life collides with the portal that she's been living in, and um, she finds a world that is full of goodness and justice, but also its opposite. It's satirical and sincere, and it's also a love letter to the endless scroll and a profound meditation on love, language, and human connection. And next we have three debut novels I wanted to just touch on. So The Bad Muslim Discount is um, an immigrant story um, that reflects the author's own experience from Karachi to California. It follows two families from Pakistan and Iraq in the 90s to San Francisco in 2016. It's about, um, it's a lens on belonging through the lens of Muslim Americans. And it begins in 1995. Um, our main character is restless, rebellious, and a sharp-tongued boy. Um, and he's doing his best to grow up in Pakistan. But as fundamentalism takes root, the family decides that they need to leave. And um, the author currently lives in California and is a practicing attorney. Then we have the smash up. So I included this because Ali Benjamin wrote one of my most favorite young adult novels that I read in a mother daughter book club called The Thing About Jellyfish, um, which took on death, uh, the death of a parent and loss and friendship in a way that I just hadn't read before and was so beautiful. So this is her adult debut about a family who's upended when their small town life becomes the ladle, latest battlefield in a culture war. Um, so it features an activist women's group outraged about Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, a distracted wife, a hyperactive daughter, and a husband that's left out. And what is that millennial babysitter really doing there? So Amy Bloom, who's a writer I admire, says, Allie Benjamin is Edith Wharton with fresh eyes. And then we have Kate Russo's debut. So she comes from a literary family. Richard Russo is her father. Um, this is a, a, a novel with a, a lonely male main character, uh, it's like a companion to Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. It's also set in the UK. And um, the, the main character is a painter, as is Kate Rousseau. Um, and he, his wife has left him. He's having a midlife crisis. And he's also broke. He hasn't sold a painting in, in a long, long time. So he moves into his artist studio and turns his capacious West London home into sort of an Airbnb. And from there, the story ensues about how he becomes involved with these temporary tenants. And next, we have a slide full of thrillers. Um, and debut, all of these are debuts. So Dangerous Women um, is based on the true story of the 1841 voyage of the transport ship Rajah. And it carried nearly 200 women convicts to a penal con penal colony across the world. Um, it examines confinement, hope, and terrifying choices that one must make to survive. And then Girl A is getting the most hype um, right now. It um, is set to be a limited TV series directed by um, the, 
the director who brought us Chernobyl. So I can only imagine how incredible this should be. It's about sibling relationships and trauma um, for readers of novels like The Room and Sharp Objects. Um, this is set in suburban England about a young girl who escapes captivity, but not the secrets that shadow the rest of her life. And it's a Marie Claire best new book of 2021. And then we have a Swedish Gothic thriller uh, set in Le Somme, the luxury hotel, which is as much a character here, kind of like The Shining. Um, our main character is a detective who's invited to her estranged brother's engagement party at the hotel. Um, when she arrives in the middle of a storm, um, it turns out that her uh, brother's fiance is, has gone missing. Guests begin to panic, more people begin to go missing and she needs to um, put on her detective uh, eye again. And then next, consent. So um, what, a, what a great blurb from the Vancouver Sun, um, this generation's answer to Alice Munro. This was long listed for the Giller Prize. It's about two pairs of sisters. Um, each, in, in, in each pair, there's a caretaker and a disabled sister, one who was um, injured in, a, in an, a car accident and the other who's intellectually disabled. Um, so this is very much about um, the complexities of familial duty. It's also about consent, power, and sex. I don't wanna give away um, the plot point, um, but really four fascinating female characters. And I thought this was another um, great quote. It's an exuberant and weirdly wonderful novel that absolutely commits to its feverish tale of damaged brains, storied couture dresses, alcoholism, mortality, rare French perfumes, tempestuous sisterhood, and cold-blooded retaliation. And um, I'm seeing a trend, this surfaces um, every now and again, um, and it's, it has with fairy tale retellings in, in novels that we're bringing out. Um, so this first is The Witcher's Heart, which um, reimagines North, Norse mythology. Uh, the author has a deep love of Norse mythology. Um, tons of research went into this um, novel about a banished witch who falls in love with a legendary trickster. Um, the author is also a Viking reenactor. And then The Charmed Wife is um, a retelling of Cinderella, but this, this time the marriage is not so perfect. 13 and a half years um, into her marriage with Prince Charming, um, she's fed up, exhausted. She sneaks out to get help from a witch who for a price offers love potions. And the potion that she wants is for her Prince Charming to, to die. Um, so this is an, a devastating autopsy of a marriage that spins happily ever after on its head. Um, great for fans of Wicked, for instance, or Circe. Um, and then the Memory Theater is um, also by a Swedish author, a fantastical tour de force about friendship, interdimensional theater and a magical place where no one ages except the young. So I just saw Midsummer again, talk about aging in Sweden and um, that setting. So I'm wondering if this setting might be um, a little bit like that. And this is getting again, great, great reviews. Um, then we have The Swallowed Man, which is a spin on um, Pinocchio. So The Swallow Man, if you can go back for a second, Brian. Thank you. Um, this is illustrated and it's based on the original Italian classic children's book of Pinocchio, not the Disney version. Um, so it's the father son, the, the um, rebellious uh, Pinocchio and, and Geppetto who has to go find Pinocchio when he's run away and of course um, ends up in, in the belly of the, the great big Fish. So this um, is super imaginative and um, Carrie, uh, the author, is an English teacher and um, also lives with his wife, the author whose work I love, Elizabeth McCracken. And in fact, I was thinking The Giant's House would be a great pairing with this sort of a husband-wife book club. And then, yes, next is How Beautiful We Were. And this is in Bolem 
Mbui's uh, next novel. Uh, she won the Penn Faulkner Award for Behold the Dreamers. Um, she grew up in Cameroon um, with a, a, a an oil refinery in town. And so this novel is inspired by that. It's a sweeping story about the collision of a small African village and um, an American oil company. And so it's, it's set in this uh, fictional African village of Kosawa. And it talks about the fear that people live amid this environmental degradation. Um, and also about our main character who um, becomes uh, a revolutionary. And it's told from the perspective of a generation of children and um, about their struggle, which lasts for decades and comes at a steep price. So everybody's really excited to, to read uh, her next novel. And then we've got some nonfiction. And uh, starting with Black Panther Party. So I know that Seattle has some history with the Black Panther um, Party and it originated in, in Oakland. Um, and this is a graphic novel. If you know of um, the graphic novels um, March, uh, I, I'm thinking of the content of this in a similar way. And uh, this is very much a history of, of the party. Um, which was a radical political organization that stood in defiant contrast to the mainstream civil rights movement. And the author's an award-winning comic book writer and filmmaker. Um, his most famous documentary is uh, took on black exploitation films called Macked, Hammered, Slaughtered, and Shafted. And then the illustrator is uh, Marcus Kwame Anderson. And much of his work explores the diversity of the African diaspora and often incorporates social commentary. So they're a great pairing for a really um, uh, provocative and different take on, on the history of the Black Panther Party. And then something really um, amazing. So One World is a fairly new imprint of ours that's headed by Chris Jackson, and they are publishing such important works about, about race in America. And this 400 Souls is um, an anthology. It's actually um, it brings together, I think, 90 writers, um, and Ibram X. Kendi and Keisha Blaine uh, founded um, this project, the 400 Souls Project. Um, Ibram Kendi, you may know um, from How to Be an Anti-Racist, which was um, such an important book for us this year. This is the first single volume history of African Americans written by a community of African Americans. And it's an all-star list of contributors, poets, um, many, like I said, 90 different uh, uh, contributors and 16 from 1619 to the present. So um, very important short stories, essays, poems, really an incredible collection. And next we have The Black Tur Church, which is a companion to the star-studded PBS documentary series uh, by Henry Louis Gates Jr. And uh, Cornel West has a great quote that I think sums up this book really well. Gates Rice rightly highlights the centrality of ambiguous legacy of the Black Church. He also explores the crucial realities of Islam and other non-Christian religious practices. And the last powerful and playful chapter on his personal dance with an elusive Holy Ghost lays bare his own signifying genius grounded in a genuine love of Black people and culture. And next we have a swim in a pond in the rain. So this amounts to George Saunders, who um, is has been writing great novels, but Lincoln in the Bardo was just a complete um, masterpiece and won the Man Booker Prize. So now this is um, a nonfiction book, which amounts to a master class in writing. And he invited some booksellers to get on a virtual call where we analyzed with him um, a checkoff story. So this is, um, the subtitle gives it away, in which four Russians give a master class on writing, reading, and life. Um, it's original essays paired with classic short stories from these masters. And it's funny, and it's great for any writer in your life, but also any Russian literature enthusiast. And next we have 
let me tell you what I mean. So Joan Didion is one of my touchstone author writers. Anything she read, the rights I'll read. And these are 12 early pieces from her career. They're mostly drawn from, um, uh, from that early period, and it includes um, essays on Gambler's Anonymous meeting, a visit to San Simeon, Nancy Reagan, to Robert Maplethorpe, to Martha Stewart, and uh, you know any any collection we bring out from her is always just really poignant. And I'm looking at this as sort of a slouching towards Bethlehem uh, type of volume. And next. A very important topical um, book by um, a, an author who is uh, studied to, you know, trained to be a, a cop. So journalist and law professor Rosa Brooks goes beyond the blue wall of silence in this radical inside examination of American policing. Uh, in her 40s with two kids, a spouse, a dog, a mortgage, she and, and a full-time job as a tenured law professor at Georgetown University, she decides to become a cop. And her account of that training to become a reserve police officer in DC is one of the most gripping and morally complex stories of its kind. It's a memoir, it's a work of journalism and scholarly exploration. Um, a really necessary book to um, the conversation we're having right now about the institution of policing and the chronic issues of criminal just, the criminal justice system and she's had real impact. Um, she founded Georgetown Law's program on innovative policing. Um, and I wanted to tell you that this quote from former New York City police officer, uh, Brandon Del, Del Pozo says, Rosa Brooks brings readers as close as they can get without taking the oath themselves. And Liz, we're gonna get to a couple questions uh, in a moment. So, uh, and you have a few more slides, so we'll just carry on, but just- Yeah, I'll, you... I'll be quick. Okay. Because I think these are all gonna be so familiar to you, except for that debut. So Bill Gates, this is his how-to about how to avoid a climate disaster. Um, and then uh, next to it, a most remarkable creature, um, really gorgeous nature writer uh, and in fact, um, David Sibley wrote about him, wrote about this book. It's a fascinating, entertaining, and totally engrossing story about um, one of the world's smartest birds of prey. So if you have people who liked H's for Hawk, that would be a great one. And then two, um, they're practically neighbors. They both live in the Bay Area. So Soul of a Woman is um, Isabel Allende, who has all these honorary doctorate. She's an amazing author. Her last book was um, a novel called The Long Petal of the Sea, and now she's writing about women and feminism. And then Dusk's Night Dawn, which is kind of got the same title trope as Thanks Help, Wow Thanks Help, I think is her previous book, one of her previous books, Anne Lamott. Um, this is about uh, being courageous, she always has the wisest, most humorous and revealing things to say. And coming in May, just a quick highlight, uh, Stacey Abrams has a, um, uh, a novel and this is set in um, the US Supreme Court, um, a female protagonist, well-rounded, likable young protagonist who's living on the edge of an ambitious career and a difficult family situation. So stay tuned for learning more about that one. And then just this one final slide um, as sort of a teaser, maybe you will have me back um, to talk about some of these um, books, but these are some of the most anticipated books from April forward. <laughs> Well, great. This has just been absolutely wonderful. Good. Um, and so we've already, so we've got a slide here about- um, um, Oh yeah, uh, signing up for this newsletter. So um, you can go to, again, if you type in Penguin Random House Library Marketing, um, you will see all of these digital resources, but certainly signing up for Borrow, Read, Repeat um, is going, you won't be sorry. We have contests and, and highlights from um, forthcoming books and author events and all of that. So any re avid reader would be happy to receive that. 
Great. Well, thank you so much. As always, it was incredibly wonderful to have you. Uh, we, we have already had a couple questions come in, but I do want to say that you have always been kind enough to offer prizes and yes, raffle offer. prizes. And we, while uh, the presentation was going on, we threw everybody's name into a little randomizer machine that we have here. And we're excited to announce that three people have won a book package from Liz, and that is going to be Eleanor Jones, Janet Callis, and Lucy Bauer. So congratulations to the three of you. We will uh, be in touch with you to uh, coordinate giving you that package. Um, and we, so let's get to some questions. So one question that's already come in is about young adult fiction. Do you have mm -hmm. any recommendations um, that you can share? Well, um, so I, uh, there were a couple of crossovers here. Um, Mermaid from Jeju was one of them and also Perestroika in Paris. Um, there, I have so many books under my wing. It's like I would want that person's email so I could email them some further suggestions. Um, young adult, uh, some of the best young adult novels that are coming out right now. Um, gee, I'm just going to have to, I, I'm so entrenched in the books I was just describing. That's <laughs> that okay. We, we can, we can connect you with, to that. Friend. You? We'll, yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to hang up and I'm going to say, why didn't I say this? <laughs> yep. Uh, we have Joan, one of our wonderful supporters, longtime supporter, asked a question about any Jewish literature that you can recommend. Any, um, Oh, always. Um, so I'm trying to think of in this list that I just, yeah, can you connect me with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then this is a really interesting question from Anne. Um, she wants to know how the pandemic has affected the publishing world. Um, um, well, so one thing is that all, a lot of our books that were set to release this year had this crazy, like I can only imagine what the editors and publishers were having to deal with talking to agents and shifting pub dates. Uh, for instance, that book Superhost that I presented, that publishing date has moved three or four times this year because it's a, you know, it was hard for somebody to have a debut novel come out in the middle of when nobody was going to bookstores or libraries or able to attend events. So um, shifting pub dates has been, um, you know, tough, uh, but I think our authors are finding that doing virtual events is bringing in more readers and more personal engagement and intimate engagement with their stories than they would have anticipated. So I, I feel that we will never return to only doing, um, you know, in store, in library appearances. We're, this is this is democratized in a way. I mean, yes, it's hard if you don't have a great internet connection, or you know, I I do understand that some people you know have hardships with with that. But it really has made events open to so many more people across the globe. So that's something. But we're as a company doing really well. I mean, we just published Barack Obama's book and sold two million. <laughs> in you know yeah. a week's time so um we're we're doing okay and we have so many client publishers that we're you know able to distribute so i feel that um it's been intense for everyone and i just thank libraries and bookstores for doing all they can to still get books in the hands of readers so so Catherine has a fun question um she likes books that are fun zany witty um but with a heart um along the lines of Auntie Mame, French Exit, The Cold Comfort Farm. Oh I was um, just gonna say Cold yeah. Comfort Farm. Yeah so any, you know, any, yeah go on. No, just any recommendations for for current or about to be published books? Okay current well because I was gonna say have you read Christmas at Cold Comfort Farm because that's what I am gonna read as soon as I go on vacation because I just am longing for that same sort of storyline. Um so uh let's see so Brian, I feel terrible, but these really general questions <laughs> about like recommendations, yeah, yeah. Are, is it okay if I email these? Absolutely. Because I'm, I'm very facile at pulling together collections of books. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We, we'd love to answer these questions and we don't expect you to, uh, uh, already your slideshows are just so incredible and so filled with details. I mean, I, I, I particularly love your gift book list. Like I'm sitting here and, and 
and I had like one person I couldn't find the right book for. And I'm like, oh, odalangi has got a new cookbook. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah. Definitely. Well, Liz, thank you so much for being You're here. Welcome. You are always um, an incredible addition. And you know, one of the benefits of this pandemic, if there are any, is, is these virtual events. It allows us to have you here with us. And we're going to, of course, welcome you back in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, we've now done 15 of these virtual events since the pandemic began. And um, it, uh, we'll, we will continue to, to do that. And again, we'll also have, um, well, in, in a second, I'll give a little bit of a library update, but we have a service at, at the library called Your, uh, Your Next Five, where uh, any of our viewers can write into a Seattle librarian and ask for book recommendations. And then they can do a little bit of research, find out what you liked, and they can um, provide uh, recommendations as well. So last question before we let you go, any snarky or dark comedies that come to mind? Snarky or dark comedies that come to mind? Oh, I mean, I, I was presenting some um, today. I was just wondering, I mean, to me, the Patricia Lockwood would be really good. Um, I'm thinking more satirical, I guess, than snarky, but they, they can be similar. And certainly Interior Chinatown, if you haven't read that. Great. Great. Okay, well, Liz, we'll let you go. I'm going to share a couple updates with our um, uh, supporters and friends now. But again, thank you for being here. And uh, you're a great friend of Seattle and our yeah. public library system. So thanks well, for being here. I love doing it. Thanks, everyone. Okay, take good care. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy holidays to you as well. Okay, bye. So uh, a quick, uh, couple quick um, closing uh, comments about our public library system. First of all, again, thank, thank you for helping to bolster um, our library's collection, both the digital and the physical materials. Um, this has been a really unique year. And um, at times like this, when we uh, need to provide as much access as we can to books, our donors and our supporters and our volunteers have been uh, there for the Seattle Public Library. So we're incredibly grateful. Um, in addition to helping the library uh, grow its collection. Our foundation donors have helped the library purchase more than 20,000 books for what we call prioritized families throughout the city who face some of the greatest barriers to creating their own home libraries and our home, home library collections. So our children's librarians and our um, programming staff have been working really hard to um, help make sure that kids have books in their homes. Um, you've also helped the library build a, a, what we call our always available reading about race collection, uh, which offers audiobooks uh, about racial justice, and many of those titles have no wait time, so they're immediately available. And I'd also, as I mentioned, would like to remind you that the librarians and the information specialists at SPL um, are always willing to help you find a book that suits your interests, and especially if, if you are looking for any local topics. Um, so you can go to SPL's website. I encourage you to go to spl.org forward slash your next five. And it's the number five, not the word spelled out. Uh, but again, you can just go to, to the um, spl.org and, and look at book recommendations. And there's some links there that can help you. But you can describe your favorite genres, authors, and subjects. Um, and the librarians will help a, curate a personal book list just for you. And as this year comes to a close, um, all of us at the foundation are, are kind of working hard on our year-end uh, giving campaign. Um, the same generous donor who put up a $50,000 challenge match earlier in our fall campaign and for Giving Tuesday has agreed to offer another $50,000 challenge match. So uh, this will go up until New Year's Eve until all the funds are used up. So. Uh, we know how much people love having their gifts match, and we're grateful for your support uh, and your support of our Challenge Match donors. So uh, now is truly the ideal time to give if you haven't already made your gift. Um, and you can do that at our website. Just go online to support spl.org. Another uh, interesting thing that the foundation is working on is we've created what we call an equity and access fund this year. Um, and that is helping to give focus support to library initiatives tailored um, for those with the greatest barriers to accessing books, technology, 
and education resources. Um, this is a specialized fund that is flexible for the library. And I would equate it to something similar to a, like a COVID relief fund. Um, so please contact us if you'd like to learn more about um, supporting the equity work um, at the library. So that is a wrap for our events uh, for 2020. We started this year with uh, two in-person events and then we did 15 of these virtual events uh, to let you know how much we appreciate your support. Our next event will be January 27th and it is an absolute favorite among many of you. It is our Seattle Times Pictures of the Year Award. And I just talked to the Times last week and they're gonna, it's gonna be really interesting. They're gonna um, focus a lot on what it was like to be a photojournalist um, during um, this very unusual year. So keep your eyes on your inbox uh, for your invitation. Once we finalize all the details with uh, our wonderful partners at the Seattle Times, we'll get that out to you. And again, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for making our Seattle Public Library a very special place for all of us to enjoy and our neighbors. I hope you have a very happy holidays. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care and stay safe. And thank you for supporting the foundation and the library.